Welcome to our LinkedIn Live on Independent Contractor Agreements. My name is Lee Morin, and I am the founding uh, member and principal attorney of Morin Legal, your small business and entertainment law practice on the East Side Beltline Trail in Atlanta, Georgia. Today, we're going to talk about independent contractor agreements. And that's pretty important right now because last year, uh, the Department of Labor proposed a uh, rulemaking that would change how we classify independent contractors. So certainly that language filters down to the contracts, but also into the reality and the circumstances that are facing lots of small businesses using independent contractors right now to meet their deadlines and to do their businesses. Certainly many companies in the entertainment sphere um, are independent contractor dependent. So let's talk about what that means. In 1989, the Supreme Court uh, determined a case called the Community for Creative Nonviolence versus Reed. Really, this is a copyright ownership case, but to determine the ownership of copyright, the court looked to whether the individual, uh, Mr. Reed, was an employee or an independent contractor and that was important because under the copyright definitions under Title 17, Section 101, at the very, very bottom of the list under W for work made for hire, you will see there are only two circumstances which require that to apply. And the first is being an employee. So certainly the court was interested in what determines employment versus independent contractor status and therefore, what determines whether the individual owned their copyright or not, or if the employer owned the copyright by virtue of the employer-employee relationship. So what were those factors that the court considered and how are they changing now? The legal precedent that was issued under this case named 10 factors, and they are what we call a totality of the circumstances test, meaning no one factor is determinative over the others, although some courts do happen to apply one factor sometimes heavily than others. Number one, the sources and the instrumentalities of the tools. I'm just gonna go through these factors and then I'll explain them. Number two, the location of the work. Number three, the duration of the relationship between the parties. Number four, whether the hiring party has the right to assign additional projects to the hired party. Number five, the extent of the hired party's discretion over when and how long to work. Number six, their method of payment. Number seven, the hired party's role in hiring and paying assistance. Number eight, whether this work is part of the regular business of the hiring party. Number nine, the provision of benefits, employee benefits. And lastly, the tax treatment of the hired party. Now, 33 years later, we go to last fall when the US Department of Labor publishes a notice of proposed rulemaking, inviting the public to comment on their decision to bring the classification of independent contractors more in line with what we talk about under the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, which is uh, the labor law that applies to workers and wage earners. So the, propose, the proposal is to rescind the rule and replace it with a new way of defining independent contractors. And we, it's very similar to what the Supreme Court factors had issued, only it is now coming up under only five factors. The five are arguably inclusive of some of the 10 factors, but we'll talk about what those are more clearly next. But why are they doing this, right? is because misclassification of independent contractors versus employees is a very serious issue. Because if one is misclassified as an independent contractor when they are an employee, they are denied certain benefits and protections under the Fair Labor Standards Act, minimum wage, overtime pay, um, and other protections. It denies uh, it also affects a wide range of workers, usually more vulnerable workers in home care, janitorial services, trucking, delivery, construction, personal services, hospitality, and restaurant industries, among others. It was pretty broad impact. 
Furthermore, misclassification allows certain employers who are heavily reliant on independent contractors to gain an unfair advantage over law-abiding businesses and which hurts the econo economy at large. So what is the economic reality test proposed by the Department of Labor and how will that impact you as a small business owner who may be heavily reliant on independent contractors to handle their business? Well, the economic reality test provides five factors, which like I said, encompasses some of the 10 um, that were issued under the Supreme Court decision back in 1989. And we're gonna talk about those a little bit in detail, but to get all the juicy detail, I suggest reading the blog. Number one, the opportunity for profit or loss depending on managerial skill. Well, if you're a worker and you earn the same paycheck every, every other week or every week or every month, and you really don't have a chance to change your profit or loss, and maybe you don't even exercise any managerial control over your own actions, then it's probably more likely that person is an employee than an independent contractor. Independent contractors are more entre entrepreneurial in nature. Uh, they certainly do manage themselves. And they also have an opportunity to create profits and losses depending on their activities. Number two, investments by the worker and the employer. This also parlays into number one because an investment made by the employer, whether it might be in equipment or tools to do the job, like a hard hat or steel toe shoes or a crescent wrench, doesn't necessarily mean that you're an independent contractor. Um, it could mean you're an employee. So that's not quite determinative. However, if you're as a worker making investments into your company in the form of capital or some other type of uh, more substantial investment to run the business, it's more likely you are in business for yourself and you are an independent contractor. Number three, the degree of the permanence of the work relationship. So not seasonal workers or folks who only come in a couple like Christmas workers and things like that. That does not necessarily mean because you're not there all year that you're an independent contractor. You could very well still be a worker. But if you're doing a job and say it has a definite start and a definite finish, more likely you're an independent contractor than an employee who has an indefinite period of employment or in Georgia, the at-will employment. Number four, the extent to which work performed is an integral part of the business. And worker who is performing work that is integral and critical to the business is more likely an employee, whereas an independent contractor will have, uh, will be performing work that is not necessarily integral, so complementary. And this actually plays into number five because that independent contractor has special skills and, and takes initiative in areas where the worker does not necessarily. Workers are more dependent upon their employers for training to acquire those skills, whereas the independent contractor brings those skills to the table. Now, that was a lot of information and I know it's hard to absorb it all. So we're gonna put this in detail into a blog for you, along with some great infographics if we can get permission to use them. So you for yourself can start thinking about what as a worker, what am I? Am I an ind independent contractor or might I be an employee in the event that this rule finally passes? And in a nutshell, the economic reality test essentially asks, are you in business for yourself or are you economically dependent on your employer, in which case you're more likely going to be considered an employee under the new classifications proposed by this rule? And like I said, workers are entitled to minimum wage, overtime pay and other labor protections under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And so we're going to get into what a consulting agreement is now a basic independent contractor agreement. So you can know a little bit about what these agreements look like and how they might read. First and foremost, we talk about services. What are the key terms to these agreements? And obviously the parties, who are the parties, who's the hiring party, who's the hired party. A lot of independent contractors use what we call loan out corporations or um, LLCs or something of that nature. Uh, and that, again, is a very strong indication you're an independent contractor as opposed to a worker. But who are the parties to the agreement is the first question we ask. 
And then what is the nature of the work? What is the job being performed? So you'll have the services, of course, will be very robust. They will be very descriptive. And then the compensation outline will also be a second key term to that independent contractor agreement. Third is ownership. If I'm not your employee, then we got to worry about the work product, right? Am I going to assign all of my work product over to you so you own the work that I'm doing? Or am I, by virtue of the nature of the work being created, for example, if it falls under copyright law and it falls under one of the few exceptions for independent contractors under work made for hire, by the way, motion pictures are included in those exceptions, then it could be a work made for hire. So certainly ownership of the results and proceeds of your work is something that is always in an independent contractor agreement. Um, and it may include moral rights, depending on, again, the nature of the work being provided. Um, in the entertainment industry, we look at credit. Everybody likes credit is something to put on your resume or something for your portfolio. Um, certainly that's not necessarily true in all types of work. Um, so that's not necessarily a key term in other industries, but it is in entertainment. And then obviously you're also going to have sections on control, the company controls versus the independent contractors uh, controls. And remember we said independent contractors are generally more, well, independent, sorry to use that word. Um, and they decide when they're going to work, what they're going to work on. And they also have their own office usually, or, or they might work on location. Um, but you're going to have that in your contract. It's going to discuss the nature of the relationship of the independent contractor. Confidentiality obviously is something that's got to be in there. Usually uh, to preserve trade secrets for the company you're working on. Um, a lot of independent contractors have more than one job. You're not exclusive. If you're exclusive, more likely you could be an employee unless it's a very short term contract. Right. Um, but Generally speaking, because you have access to information that might not be public, confidentiality is something that a lot of uh, hiring parties look to when they're hiring independent contractors. And we're not gonna get into it now, but we'll get into it in a couple of weeks, but you'll have all the nons, the nons, I call them, the non-compete, non-solicitation, non-disparagement, because non-compete is up for, is up for uh, discussion also as of this year. We'll get into that in a couple of weeks. And then last but not least, go back to my Contracts 101 LinkedIn to get the key terms of basic contracts, but reps, warranties, and indemnities, remember they go together like carrots and peas, term and termination, because again, this is a finite period. It's not indefinite. So you're going to want to know when your job starts, where your job is, and where it ends. And last, liabilities, remedies, and the usual boilerplate. Again, go back to our Contracts 101 class, please, to get those last few key terms. We're not going to take up any more time on that today. We've given you a lot of information in a very short period of time, but I hope it was helpful. And certainly, please, please, please sign up for our blog. In the comments, you'll find a link to our website. If you scroll down on the home page, you can sign up for our newsletter. You'll get the blog on this topic with more in-depth coverage, infographics, and a sample contract agreement. So we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. And also in two weeks on April 19th, we'll be talking about the Federal Trade Commission's proposed rule to eliminate non-compete agreements and also talk more in depth about employer employee agreements and what to expect there. Thank you so much for joining us. If you've survived this song, I am so grateful. My name is Lee Morin. I'm the owner of Morin Legal, your small business and entertainment law practice on the Atlanta Beltline. And we'll see you in two weeks. This has been our LinkedIn Live.